We're talking about the rules that govern dating. The Ten Commandments of Dating Iconics. That's not really my idea. I got the name from Ben Young. It was a book I wrote, I read about, um, how many years ago now? <laughs> I don't know, some two decades there about. And it left a lasting impression on me. And um, I want to encourage other people to take a cue from it. It's not out of place to have a date. But what becomes a problem is not understanding what the dating experience is supposed to be for. And that's why I'm sharing these 10 rules, these 10 commandments, these 10 principles that should govern you. The principle number one is that you must have a life. I've really, really talked extensively on it. Today, I'll be talking about rule number two, commandment number two, and it is thou must use your brain. I would appreciate if you're not yet married, you're single, and I'm ready to mingle. You want to say this after me? That before I tie the knot, before I cross the line, before I walk down the line, I will be able to convince myself that I have used my brain. What does it mean to use your brain? It's, um, how do I start now? It's about balancing the heart with the head. It's about not losing your head completely in the course of emotion. Why do I, do I say that? The culprit is romantic love. It's romantic love. It's a grand illusion. We always think that when you meet the person you want to marry, it will sweep you off your feet. And then when you see her, you will not be able to hold your breath anymore. And you won't be able to coordinate yourself. And you can't do anything until you just marry him or her. That is so absolutely wrong. Because that is not the way it happens in marriage generally. Yeah. We're saying that romantic love has little to do with real love. What keeps a marriage is real love. What destroys a marriage is romantic love. Now, what is the place of romantic love? Does it mean that romance does not have a place in marriage at all? Romance does have a place. It's actually the introduction. Because most times, you don't get attracted to someone that you don't like. Someone that you, you cannot even relate with. Something must be an attraction. So, today I'll be talking about what really is true love. How do you identify it? And then how do you grow in it? I will talk a little bit about love as I continue in my commandment number two that thou must use your brain. What really is love? And what is love? What, what is not love? That we don't make that mystic. The most misunderstood concept is love. Especially in English language. When was the last time you said to me, I love that food? Or, oh, I love your dress. We just use the word love loosely. But if we go back to the Greeks, they actually um, divided love into different, you know, understanding. There's what they call the filio, the eros, you know, the sterego, and the agape love. I don't want to bore you with that. But the only love that can sustain a marriage is the agape love. Is the love that has no condition. Is the love that has no reason. And then we understand that the eros is what we know. Is the, is the love that has reasons and that's the problem so love is a response to the understanding of the value of a thing you keep your gold in a special place not on your dressing table you buy you know maybe you just buy an apple watch somehow you look at yourself i just spent four fifty dollars then you want to keep it specially unlike the watch you bought for two 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 hundred naira you know so that, this one costs me 200000 This one cost me $200. You just kind of put a value on it. Or someone gives you a Rolex watch. You keep it in a special place until you realize that it is fake. And you just throw it anyhow. So love, you can say, is a response to the understanding of the value of a thing. So you keep valuable things valuable. Value is then measured by what you are willing to spend for something. So let's say, for instance... I like cars and I just want to buy the latest Range Rover. I am willing to pay, you know, a whooping 45 million naira to buy that. Some other person will say to you, God forbid, I can't spend that on a car when I don't have a house. I would rather go and spend that kind of money on my house. 
So it's about what do you put value on. So what is valuable to you? I'm still describing real love. I'm saying that romantic love is eros. And the love that can sustain a marriage is the agape love. It's the real love. Okay? Now, what again is love? I'm describing love is a force generated by a decision. Love is a force that is generated by a decision. So that brings us to something. That true love is not a feeling. True love is a decision. True love is a choice. True love is an act of the will true love is a decision true love is a choice true love is an act of the will and true love is informed by knowledge is informed by knowledge no wonder the bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge most of us that go into marriage we actually destroy that marriage because we're not knowledgeable about the parameters or the yardstick that make marriage work so if you're here today and you're yet to say I do, then this meeting is for you. You better listen and listen attentively. I'm talking about, you know, 10 commandments, 10 rules that govern dating. And this is rule number two, thou must use your brain. So the Eros love, the romantic love is ill designed to bear the weight of life stresses. Life can be stressful and Eros cannot help you. So what then is romantic love? Does it have a place at all? Yes. Is there, any room, is there any value in romance? Yes, there is some value in romance. So we're not here to say, oh, throw romance out, just, you know, no fun, no excitement in your marriage. No. So, but it's, I, I would describe romantic love as the beginning, the introduction. So if you're writing an exam and all you do write is paragraph one and you expect to have an A, definitely you're going to have an F. So it's just the prologue, it's the introduction, it's the attraction phase. You don't go to a house and stay in the ante room, okay? They will take you in. If you're going to stay there for a week, they won't just hang you there suspended at the corridor. They bring you in. So romantic love is like getting to the corridor or to the ante room of a house. But the real love takes you into the guest room and into the family lounge. That is what we are talking about. So it means that the romance and passion, romance and passion is an aspect that, em that, that enhances what we have rather than what functions as the foundation of our relationship. Romance enhances what we have. Romance attracts us to who we intend to work with. Romance, you know, opens the door, but it does not sustain it. And I want you to know that. So if your, your heart is doing giz giz to someone right now, it's okay. But don't lose your brain in the course of that. So I'm still talking about... Um, Commandment number two. So I'm still explaining the place of romance. So I believe that romance must be recognized for what it is. An introduction to someone who could be a potential mate. An introduction to someone who could be a potential mate. So I will link, liken romance to a stapler. You know, like you're writing your project and you have about 100 pages. Before you submit it to your supervisor, you staple it. That is just temporary binding. So romance is like the temporary binding on a book. But when you really want to submit the book, you take it to the binder and then they glue it and that becomes permanent. So couples must not make a commitment upfront to balance romance with you, you must make a commitment upfront to balance romance with common sense, balance your excitement with reason, balance your romance with judgment, balance your romance with discernment. I said, balance your romance with common sense, with reason, with judgment, and discernment. I'm going to talk about the three drives of romantic love. But before I do that, let's just take this song. And um, I'm sure you will enjoy it. If we had it um, last week. It was Infamous Lady by Miss Eva. You would enjoy it. And then we continue after the song. Thank you very much. I am the infamous lady that fella spoke about. 
I do the lady dance, and yes, I am the monster. Of my mind, subject to me to my master. A three in one, not nice cafe, but keeps me sharp with his word. Two words sore, teaches me how to pray, slay. Evil, fashion, haters, every day, yes. I am the master of my mind, a mastermind, many great phenomena. I will the thoughts to change the world, my optimism is infectious, yes. My confidence is intense. I wear my heart on my apparel. My beauty is not always apparent, but it is there, deep rooted. I am one with the earth, though through the sands of time you trod me in the dirt, yet I am fertile ground. Whatever I take in multiplies, I can take you to the skies. I am the infamous lady that I spoke about. Infamous lady, don't need you calling me baby. Beautiful swan peacocking, daring to take flight on eagle's wings, gentle as a dove, wise as a serpent. Can you see my brand new wings? I am the infamous lady that the last spoke about. I do the lady dance, and yes, I am the master. Things did not get easier, but see, I got stronger, wiser, faster, smarter, better. I am the infamous lady that the last spoke about. I am working so hard that you have so much to talk about, so keep talking as I sign out with peace, love and blessing, the infamous lady that fella spoke about. Infamous lady, don't need you calling me baby. Paul says it is better for a single man to marry than to burn. Are you single, married, widowed, separated or divorced? Join me on Family Today. Family Today with Fumi Johnson is one program that will bring you in alignment with who you truly are and open your mind to how you rock your significant interpersonal relationships while sidestepping the landmines, culture, religion and society have laid in your path. Family Today with Fumi Johnson goes where others are shy to go and shines the light in the dark corners others have forgotten. Tune in at 11.30 a.m. every Friday to listen to Family Today with Fumi Johnson on Inspiration 92.3 FM. Okay, we're back. Um, you're still joining the conversation. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Fumi Johnson 1, numeric 1. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments of Dating, and I'm commandment number 2, and it is thou must use your brain. And I'm saying the key is balance the head with the heart. Don't just follow your heart like they tell you. Come on, use your brain. You must use your brain. Now, I'm talking about the three drives of romantic love that you need to watch out for and i want you to listen attentively number one is emotions number two is hormones and number three is spiritual leading and i would explain that what is emotion driven dating emotion driven dating is that dating that sweeps you off your sense of reasoning period you know you just look at the person and say we are compatible you know, we like the same thing, we like the same football club, we like the same food. I like eating my food hot, he likes eating it hot too. Oh, his favorite um, um, destination um, is Hawaii. Oh my God, he likes desert, desert safari. Oh no, for God's sake, that is euphoria. It will wipe off. You don't know his parents, you don't know his background, you don't know what he does, you don't know his bank account, you don't know his attitude to money, you don't know his relationship priorities. And you say, oh, we are compatible. No. I mean, I, I, I tweeted something yesterday and I'm saying that soulmates are not met. Soulmates are devel developed in the trenches of life. Soulmates are developed, you know, when you face challenges together and you come out the other side. 
So all those ones, oh, we've met your perfect soulmate. There is nothing like that. So emotion-driven dating, you know, is relationship built on emotionalism, and they can be quite deadly. So beware if you are engaged, and all you can say is what the person wears, you know, how the person looks, oh, he's six feet tall, broad shoulder, is my dream man, I actually saw that picture, and no, no, look beyond the physical. Someone asked me a question, said, what should we concentrate on, the container or the content? <laughs> and I laughed. Yeah, the container is very important, you don't want to wake up with someone you don't want to see. But excuse me, I know people that are married as a size, size 8, and after three children, they became size 16. So what are you going to do? Pack the person away? No, no, you can't do that. So you can't just concentrate as much as the container is important, but I will go for the content. So emotion-driven dating is something you should look over. Then the second one is hormone-driven dating. What is hormone-driven dating? It is the dating that is triggered by sexual escapades. You know, you are like, she, he or she gives you the styles that you want. Excuse me? Or... I want to really, really go deep down, so we need to get married. And then you go ahead as, as you go as far as quoting the scripture. You say, oh, you know, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Paul says, if you are behaving uncomely towards your virgin, then do what you want to do. Go and marry. If you go and marry because you want to have sex, <laughs> you are in trouble. Do you think it will be available for you every day of the marriage? No. What about when the woman is pregnant? What about when the woman gives birth and compulsively, at least for a few weeks, she's not able to? What's going to happen? Are you going to force yourself to control yourself then or you just help yourself with the household? So, hormone-driven dating is another danger of um, romantic love. Okay, so don't marry because you can't control your sexual urges. Okay, find another reason to marry. Then the third one, this one is going to be a bit tricky and sensitive, is a spiritual-driven dating. You see, as a marriage counselor, I have people say to me, I said, did you like this person? I said, I'm not sure, but the Lord told me. I said, which Lord? I said, which Lord? God is not going to live with you in the marriage. How can it be God telling you to marry someone you don't like a mannerism, you don't like how she dresses, you don't like what it looks like, but you say, you know, I had a dream, I had a vision, and God told me. Or the, the, the overseer told me. No, no, no. Spiritual demon dating is a problem waiting to happen okay if god is leading one of you then he will be leading both of you so don't let someone else interpret god's leading for you and i want to tell you this the spirit of god bears witness within you whatever god is leading you to it must have a confirmation within you so don't let one spiro jim jim brother or sister come to you and say oh i've already seen it god has already told me i know many people that are in trouble today um, because they felt that God led them, but rather they were just led by something else. The mere fact that she sang well in the choir does not mean God is leading you to her. So does, does it mean that we are opposed to spirituality in dating and making important decisions? No, 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 no. In fact, I vigorously, vigorously affirm that you seek God for guidance. You see, I have three young adults, and what I told them is this. Now that you are not desperate, now that you are not anxious, this is the time to settle it. You know, sit down, take a time out, and I'm going to give you the same assignment. Take a time out, a day or two, and say, God, right now, you know, I'm not under pressure. So I want to sort it out with you. What kind of a man do I want to marry? What kind of a woman do I want to marry? What should I look out for? How can you lead me? How can you guide me? How can you protect me so I don't make mistakes? Hey, beloved, marriage is important. Marriage, some people say, is 50 years plus or minus 5. If you marry at 25, by 70, let's say, you pack it up at 70, you'll have been married for 45 years. But with life expectancy these days, we can go up to 80, 85. Do you want to live 65 miserable years? No, I don't think you want to do that. So don't say that, oh, I just saw a dream or, you know, one spiritual leader told me and then some of you take names and go and give it to one who will leave somewhere and they say, oh, we have seen it, it's going to work. No, the sole person responsible for the choice in marriage is you is you and i want you to take that very seriously but if you have worked with god in such a way that you know how he leads you okay then it will be easy for you and don't start gambling as to how god will lead you in your marriage when you haven't trained yourself to know how he will lead you as to where to work what course to study you know and 
so many other things. I remember 1992, I was going to get a job. And I went for the interview and I felt expressly God telling me, you will be taken but you will not walk there. And I was like, what are you saying, God? I need to walk. But I knew how God spoke with me. Of course, I went for the interview because he said I would be taken. That means I, I needed to be there. But whilst I was waiting to be interviewed, I saw an old two weeks old newspaper. And I was flipping through. And I saw another advert. And I knew, I had a witness in my spirit that I think God is saying to me, check that advert. And invariably, that was the job I got. I was taken in that other place, but God only led me there because he wanted me to see that two weeks old newspaper that I did not have access to. God walks in diverse ways his wonders to perform. And God is interested in who you marry. And God wants you to be happy. Okay? Marriage does not give you happiness. <laughs> marriage does not give you happiness. And happiness is circumstantial. Okay? You become happy when you are able to put some things in place. And you develop joy when you, when you work on your marriage. So I'm still talking about the second commandment, thou must use your brain. I'm going to use the acronym BRAIN, and I want you to take note of this. BRAIN is spelled B-R-A-I-N. B means balance the head with the heart. Balance the head with the heart. When you see that guy, when you see the girl, and your heart makes these days, you know, and you sing the song, you make my heart skip a beat every time I see you. Still find time to cool down and reason and balance those things. What did he say his priorities are? What is his goal in life? What is his ideology or philosophy or principle about some things that you will not compromise on? It's important for you to go. Number two, our, I say refrain from physical intimacy. Refrain from physical intimacy. Someone asked me, how long should the kiss be? Excuse me? What's wrong with a peck? Once you start kissing, you are already introducing yourself to erotic feelings. You may not be able to control how far you can go. So as much as possible, refrain from physical intimacy. Another question I was asked is, what do you mean by that? How would we know if we are sexually compatible? I said, how did Adam know that he was sexually compatible with Eve? You don't need to test it. There's always a first time. And both of you can walk towards it. And I'm digressing to say this. I'm saying this to both the male and the female. Virginity is not exclusive, it's not, it's not, it's not exclusive to girls alone. It is important for you as a man to be a virgin, to be, to be someone that has not had any sexual relationship with a new woman. Let the wife, let the wife of your youth be the only one you've met. It will be a sure, sure anchor for your soul. It will be a good remedy for adultery because you don't have anything to compare with. And together you can work it out. So balance your head, the, the head with the heart. Refrain from physical intimacy. The A is analyze your past relationship. What do I mean by that? Every relationship, you know, leaves something in you. For instance, not necessarily a boy-girl relationship. If everywhere you go they say you are noisy, you are lousy, oh, you are too irritating, that means there's something about you. If you, if you look at them... Um, some relationships, like relationship with your parents, they keep saying something about you. You're selfish. Oh, you're so self-absorbed. Hey, work on it before you go and say, I do. So analyze all past relationships that you've been involved in and see the recurring decimal, good or bad, and then adjust as it is necessary. I'm talking about the acronym BRAIN. We've talked about B-R-A. I is include others in the process. I cannot overemphasize this. What does it mean? The Bible says in multitude of counsel, there is safety. Please let other people be involved in that choice. I used to have a friend. She got married pretty late. We were already married. And she said to me, you know, love is blind. If I don't um, see anything about this guy, please help me to see. And I think you should do that. And then involve your parents. They love you. Involve your pastors, your mentors. Let them at least have an input in that choice. And the end is never neglect opportunities to evaluate along the way. Never neglect opportunities to evaluate along the way. I cannot continue because of time and um, 
I know you want to ask a lot of questions. I didn't open the phone lines because I wanted to really, really exhaust this today. I will give you opportunities. But you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, Fumi Johnson one And you can send me questions on family today at FumiJohnson.com. You can send a text to 0802-318-2030. I'm too fast, 0802-318-2030. We'll continue again next week, 11.30, every Friday. Thank you. Family Today with Fumi Johnson is powered by The Capstone, Church Without Walls.